Emocjonujących wrażeń życzy Energa z Grupy Orlen. Sponsor strategiczny festiwalu Energa Camera Image. Electronic medical services available to the residents of the Kujawsko Pomorskie Wojewodeship. Results from ultrasound and X ray machines are immediately transferred onto the doctor's computer and are available online. What does it mean for you? Faster diagnostics, no waiting in queues, easy communication with doctors from different units, and access to test results at any time. We provide electronic medical documentation for you. Toruń znajduje się na liście Światowego Dziedzictwa Kulturowego UNESCO. To też miejsce, które kocha film z wzajemnością, stając się planem zdjęciowym dla wielu produkcji. Ciekawe plenery pomoże Ci szybko znaleźć kujawsko-pomorski geoportal. Największa przestrzenna baza wiedzy o regionie. To publiczny, darmowy, dostępny dla każdego zbiór map. Prezentuje m.in. ponad miliony działek, budynków, drogi, placówki oświatowe, zabytki i obszary chronione. Wejdź na geoportal Mój Region Info i kręć w Kujawsko-Pomorskie.
Odpręż się i daj się porwać emocjom. Prawdziwe przeżycie. Coś dla każdego. Spędź jesień z kanałami Filmbox. Poruszające biografie. Uciekam przed nienawiścią. Historyczne zwycięstwa. Filmy pełne wzruszeń i emocji. Raz się żyje. W listopadzie w Kino Polska. Włącz RMF Classic i zmień swój świat. RMF Classic. Najpiękniejsza muzyka filmowa. Fakty RMF. Najbardziej wiarygodne źródło informacji. RMF FM. Radio numer jeden w Polsce. Szybka, intuicyjna, przejrzysta, nowa RPPL. Polecam redaktor naczelny Cezary Szymanek. Nadszedł czas, by usiąść w kinowym hotelu. Poczuć dreszcz filmowych emocji. Otoczyć się ekranami Screen X. Poczuć każdy ruch i zakręt z Ford X. I powtórzyć to kolejny raz i kolejny. Ile tylko chcesz. Najwyższy czas. Poczuć magię kina. W najlepszym wydaniu. Przeżywaj więcej. Cinema City. Partnerem motoryzacyjnym festiwalu Kamer Image jest Autofrenik. Autoryzowany dealer Mercedes-Benz. Chcesz być z nami? Zaszczep się. Anastas and I, uh, we're going to try to talk about the relation between uh, DOP and operators. Um, I think it's a bigger field than I originally thought uh, by discussing with, with Tas. Um, the origin, the idea I had in, in, um, in uh, uh, thinking about this, this conversation is that um, I felt that philosophically I was a real anarchist, meaning that I hate the idea of power, of command, of obedience, of following orders. All of this um, uh, is not in my DNA. And um, in complete contradiction of that, when I think of my attitude on the set, I have to remind myself that I've been very dictatorial at times and <laughs> almost tyrannical. Um, so this, this contradiction that I don't like the idea of hierarchy and commanding, and on the other end, I've been behaving like as if I did. Um, 
So that's the origin of this um, conversation. And of course, Tas and I, we've done, what, seven films together? Uh, and I would, have. And I would have gladly continued if Taz didn't move up and become a proper DP. So um, here we are. Here so, we are. So um, Philippe, I don't think, has really operated many films. I think you said you operated one for somebody else? Yes, for somebody else. Yes, only and once. then for the rest of them, I he was his own operator. <laughs> Yeah. While I, on the other hand, um, started as a Steadicam operator, who then became a B camera Steadicam, and then A camera, et cetera. And um, so it's, it was interesting, the first phone call I got from Philippe, uh, which was, he had just finished a film called A River Runs Through It, a tiny little no film, <laughs> and um, called me up when I was in New York, and we had a lovely conversation on the phone as to whether or not I he would hire me. And that was, I guess, the first part of the process of talking about operating and what the relationship is, is ultimately what do we look, f what did he look for in an operator? And what did I think at the time as an operator to work with a direct, with a director of photography? Um, what did you, what, well, what made you hire me? I never asked him this question. Um. Well, I, I the, the, the only film I'd done in the United States was River and Street, which I operated because it was a film where there's very min minimal use of lights. So, uh, and I wanted to operate it, otherwise I would have been bored to death sitting on the bank of the river and looking at the clouds. Um, so I, I knew no one in the United States uh, to call. And then I think it's uh, one of the producers that... Uh, told me, oh, I know a guy, I just worked with a guy, he's very, very good, and uh, do you want his number, and uh, do you want to try it? And, and, and we were in a fairly uh, rush process, if I remember. I needed yes, it, somebody... Yes, it was come back next week or something. Yeah, it was two very, weeks. It, if not two days or something like that. So I said, okay, well, uh, I, I give him a call, and you're the only one that I called, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And, um, oh. and so I said, oh. you know... No, That's but I mean, nice. the, the problem in hiring people uh, is, okay, you say, well, I've got 15, 15 names and I'm going to see them all and you're going to ask the same question. And once you've seen everybody, uh, you still what do know. you do? Uh, you take the, the name out of a hat. So you might as well, I exaggerate a little bit, but... You might as well take the first one and, and not bother seeing for 14 people. Uh, and we had a conversation, which I can't remember. I didn't record it. Um, the conversation, I said, well, this guy seems to make sense. And, uh, and so I said, well, uh, hurry up, come next week. And, and, and then you came and I sent you to do shots on your own for a, right. for a week. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I do remember that. Um, yeah, because the interesting relationship is, um, particularly back when it was in the film days, the camera operator was the first person to see the image, literally intimately, you know? Um, and so therefore, I remember Philippe often asking me, because we did seven films together, you know, and um, he had a penchant of being a little dark on some of his thriller exposures. And I remember very clearly in being in a uh, confessional with Brad Pitt on a film, and Philippe, every time we said cut, he kept on saying, can you see anything? Can you see anything? And I was like, mm, maybe his right eye? You know, I, maybe not, we'll wait until tomorrow. Um, but what that speaks to is the trust level that we have with people that we collaborate with, you know? And that kind of thing, I think that was our third or fourth film together, um, where we got to a point where we could collaborate. Um, and, and being, like I said, so I have operated for several DPs, and by the time Philippe had, um, had called me, um, I, I had used the experience of Steadicam and going to operate, um, and. For me, it was gathering not just how do I work with other people and other DPs, but also what can I absorb from the process, you know? Um, and I'm gonna tell a short story here because we, we talked about this. It was day one of shooting. Um, 
and uh, Philippe was at a light upstage on the set somewhere, and we were just literally chatting about something while he was dropping a single in or whatever he was doing. And he said, oh, is this going to be in the frame? And um, I said, oh, well, let me go back to the camera and check. And he stopped me right there. And he said, I'll never forget, use your knowledge of optics and tell me if my light will be in your frame. <laughs> Which, of course, made me do two things. It made me understand what the level of professionalism expectation I was expected to give at that moment. Um, and it also made me understand what the DP was looking for in terms of his or her um, support system. And I think part of that relationship and part of that collaboration is a support system. Um, because often um, I would pitch a shot or decide to pitch a shot or say, maybe, how about we do this? And, you know, I would get the look, well, how are we going to like that? You know, right? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so the, the, that's sort of the, the, the genesis of this relationship. Um, and it, it uh, went on for seven films. Yeah. You know? yeah, just to add to that, I realized, even talking, that what uh, DP, oh, what I, I, I can't talk for every DP on the planet, obviously, but what I look for, um, for uh, an operator is basically a clone of myself, and not really a clone of myself, an idealized clone of myself. <laughs> Meaning somebody that will be able to do exactly what I want, but better. Even if I don't admit that anyone can do better, you know. Because you're much more forgiving when I operate, you know, and, and I keep that in consciously. When I see an operator and that, you know, they do something wrong with the, with the frame, and I say, what is he doing, doing that? And I know if I was operating, I would probably do the same mistake and say, okay, well, I'll try better. I'll do better for the next one. Forget it. doesn't matter, you know. Um, <laughs> So that relation that, that, that with, with the operator sometimes goes way too far in the sense that you need this idealized uh, version of yourself. And um, I must say sometimes you find it. I mean, I find it definitely with Stas and with uh, other operators I've been working with after, after, after you, you moved up. Uh, and that's what I like in an operator is basically a better clone. Now, how to define that, it's a bit difficult. Yes, because um, for me, after having 10 years of operating and then moving up and finding, having to find somebody to collaborate with, it starts to go to the point of what is the collaborative process. Um, and in much of it, when I was a camera operator to director of photography, collaboration, it kind of, it, it certainly lended itself to what is the director and the director of photography conversation. Um, because there was a, 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 for me anyway, a, the same sensibilities of um, not only just trying to come up with the creative idea uh, and, and support, but this also support a, an idea that's, that the director has. Um, or support the idea in general, because I firmly believe that or once once an idea is put forward, it does not have authorship. Or the idea that the director doesn't have. Right, exactly. Or the idea that the director doesn't have, which is, you know, um, candidly, more often than not. You know, out of the uh, many times, you know, you're on a set and there's 22 shots to do that day, 15 or 10 or 7, and one of those is the director goes, hey, you know, in prep, why don't we do this? Um, so that was a really interesting sort of leap to, to, to understand between this relationship and then when I moved on to my own relationship with, with operators. Um, and also I think that for the operator part too is that um, it speaks to what Philippe was just saying. It's a virtuosity of instrument. Um, a camera operator, unlike a director of photography, holds an instrument in their hand. And it's how, how, what is your technical skill, as well as your 
collaborative, creative skill that you bring forth to the table. Um, because often, um, like Philippe and I said, you know, you go, oh wow, that guy's, you know, that woman, the guy is really, really good on the wheels or really, really good technically because they know the instrument. Um, and and I, I, I have to say, I certainly am more rusty than I was. Philippe and I used to be so good that I remember on several films, including Mary Riley, on the stairway scene, on a crane, on a remote head, he would grab the pan and I would grab the tilt. Well, that was for fun. And it was fun, but, actually. But you it can was do fun. It. Yep. But, it, but it, what it, what it was an interesting thing that Sometimes you could have to do on that, the set. though. And it was really, I would grab the tilt because I happened to be there in front of the thing. And then Philippe would come running by and he'd be wandering over and I'd you know, take my hand off and off we'd go. Um, and why? Because it was fun, you know? Um, and so having that sort of sensibility and that sort of creative um, uh, camaraderie mm -hmm. uh, really made the, in, the rest of the process, and I only bring it forward because it's not like we did it for any technical reason. It was just, it made the rest of the creative process um, so much more collaborative because it was the physical manifestation of that. Because we did that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. We also used to throw each other off the camera as well. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, um, yeah, and there's something that I noticed also throughout the years because, the, as you know, um, uh, we've got more and more tools and more and more complicated tools. I mean, you know, the remote heads, the, the various cranes, the techno crane, whatever. You know, it's getting, a, 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 especially on, on, on big, on big budget film, you've got tons and tons of equipment. And then the operator is, for me, the one responsible to have those, uh, those uh, technical thing to work. And you know, with the grip, there's, there's sometimes, you know, oh, shall we do it with the technical range? Shall we do it with a steady cam? Shall we do this shot like this way or this way? So that the operators is a real, very important role to play there. And in consequences, knowing better most of the time than the DP what the tools can do leads to get more interesting shots also. So basically there's a feedback from the operator to the DP saying, you know what, this shot that you want is a great idea, but with this machine we can do it differently or we can do it better. So that's where your, the creativity of the of the the operator is important because he he's uh, he passes on a technique that the DP doesn't necessarily control completely. Right, and then that's that where I spoke of the virtuosity of 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 equipment, you know, and how to how do you best use it, which then speaks to the other part of the collaborative process because I think that ultimately DP. For me, quite honestly, um, I remember doing my first big Hollywood movie that Philippe recommended me for, and I was thinking, gosh, camera operator really is the best job in the business. Um, because all that one worried about was that particular shot. Did you execute that shot? You didn't think about whether the sun was going down. You didn't think about whether or not you were gonna make your day because the actor was here or not here, or the director changed their mind. Philippe and I were on a film we had scouted this courtroom. This was on Larry Flint. I don't know if you remember. We had scouted a courtroom. Um, Philippe and Jack English had lit the courtroom. Our director came, Milos Forman, and he walked into the courtroom, which he had previously seen, but what he had forgot and didn't recognize that there were only six jury boxes, seats. And we were ready to go. And he was like, why are there only six? And I was like, well, there were six here when we looked at it, you know. Next thing we do, and we're in a federal courthouse, Philippe and Milos are walking around in circles on various floors trying to get another courtroom, you know. And I was like, I'll, I'll point the camera wherever you want me to point the camera, you know. I mean, I'll, th that, that responsibility wasn't there. Um, but the responsibility and, that I learned was also of time management that the time that I took, Philippe was talking about the idea that the operator was in charge of the equipment, but also in charge of why is that dolly track taking so long? Why is that dance floor? I mean, I would say, hmm, it'd be a better shot. It should be a dance floor. 
And if he looked around and I hadn't cleared it, it was like, no, the dance floor is going to take six more minutes than the dolly track, and I don't have that. So it's also that symbiotic relationship on set of, it's not always what is the best for the shot, it is what is the best for the film. And I think when you have a relationship that finally understands that, it took me seven films to understand it. But when you have that relationship, um, then you recognize how, you know, how much fun that is. You know? I mean, it really is a wonderful position, I have to say. Um, great, great fun. Uh, well, I, I, I actually had such a little experience of being a, someone's operator um, that... Uh, well, you were a really fun guy to operate for. Let me put it that okay. way. Okay, well, thank you very much. You're a really fun guy to have along, you know, because actually we had quite a, a lot, of, lot of occasion to, to giggle <laughs> and to laugh. Um, you, you know, mostly at the expense of other people. Right. But... Uh, that, um, Okay, now because I uh, I I don't want this this uh, thing to be a, a lecture no. or a conference, you know. So uh, I will welcome anyone to ask questions, raise their hands, and and out oh, it's one. That's that was quick. Oh no, sorry. Can you I, give me one minute? I would like I would like to know how many uh, yeah. men or women here are actually. Operators. Oh, or, or have only, operated, or, or, or have operated for somebody. Well, you've done your own film, but you've actually also operated for yeah. okay. uh, DP. Cool, cool, cool. Sorry. Uh, so my apologies. Yeah, yeah. Your question. Uh, no worries. Would you say a Steadicam is mandatory for an operator? Oh, sorry. Can you repeat? Would you Would you say that Steadicam is mandatory for an operator for you? What has the Steadicam meant for me? For no, like it is mandatory to oh. learn that tool no. as an operator. No, no, it's uh, not at all. It's you know, it depend depend the film you you're doing. Uh, I've been I've been working uh, with you where you were a camera and uh, and Steadicam. Then I worked with Neil Norton, who was like um, uh, a camera. And steady cam, but after that I worked with Des Whelan and uh, Vince McGowan. That was the steady cam B camera and and steady cam. You know what? It's it really depends on the kind of film. But asking every operator to be uh, a steady cam operator that's crazy, because oh, I yeah. think first doing steady cam is crazy. It's very bad for your your backbone. Uh, it gets better, it's but it's good you know, for your bank account. I'm leaving. Um, uh, no, you you cannot ask that because it's a it's a very physical. As you know, it's a very physical thing, and uh, it, it, nothing like that should be mandatory. And some people love to do this day cam, and I, I, I'm, it's great with that. Uh, and I must say, from my experience, that I've had steady cam operators, no name. Uh, we were very good with the steady cam and incapable of doing uh, an A camera. Sometimes your know, skills are fragmented, and on the other hand, I work with Steadicam operators that were also a great A camera, uh, or A or B, because for me, A and B is just, I, I put A and B on the same, on, on, on the same line, basically, because uh, even if the B camera does fewer shots sometimes, they still need to be very good, you know? So A and B, same thing. Can I, I, I'm going to interject there and say that um, the Steadicam itself is a very idiosyncratic skill set. You know, it's, it's, it's physical and whatnot that goes with that. So, and not everybody is interested in doing it or interested in moving the camera that way. Uh, in terms of A and B camera, though, interesting enough, I've always, and with Philippe, with, when I was an operator, I owned every frame. In other words, um, if there was going to be an insert, I wanted to do it. If there was going to be a B camera, I wanted to talk to Philippe and go, well, should it be over here? Should it be over there? If I'm on this lens, should we put that lens? You know, it wasn't just this free form other camera that got pulled up. Unless it was, of course, obviously, Philippe did a, most of our B camera stuff, actually. 
lately I've been relegated to the C camera. C camera, I remember once asked, yeah. I did ask him to come up once to do D camera for me on a show, but too bad he was doing, you know, the Fantastic Beasts or something. But anyway, um, so the other thing about operating is, though, is set management. Because the director, you know, as a DP, you are not only setting up that shot, but you're setting up the shots for the rest of the day in conjunction with the gaffer and the, and the director, you're, you're coming up and trying to do your master plan. So the idea of, you know, should this bottle be here or here? Uh, should the camera be slightly up or down? Um, like I said before, is, the, is it gonna be the dolly or the, or the dance floor? All that kind of discussion is, is, is a camera running set, you know? Maybe I can also ask the question again for you because you started as an operator with the Steadicam, would you say that you had to learn it to get to a position of an ACAM operator, or would you say, I could have done it any other way? I think that's a, a very valid question in the sense of a career path, because if you're an assistant, which I did not do on feature films, I was only an assistant on documentaries, um, one tries to put yourself um, into the workforce being noticed. And so if you recognize the competitive level of the number of people who did Steadicam, particularly when I started, which was way back when, uh, versus the number of operators there were, it made perfect sense to then become skilled at something that was quite technically different, difficult. So therefore I became a much more marketable you know, I mean, I don't know if uh, you were looking for a steady cam operator slash um, on Summersby, you were, yeah, how was that very first shot? You remember when the key grip had to pull me up the hill? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. So the very first shot on this film, Summersby, it's a film, it's anamorphic, and it's a 50 mil primo lens. <laughs> and um, it's following, pulling Jodie Foster up a hill to a house. Oh, yeah. And it's, I didn't know the, I didn't know anybody. And I do one take, two takes, three takes, and I realize I don't, I ran out of gas. And luckily, Philippe's key grip, Alan Rollins, has this best boy, which was this Andonis of a guy. He was like six foot six and, you know, fully muscled and literally picked me up and hauled my ass up the hill. Um, and that's actually the very first shot of, the, the, of yeah, that movie. I, uh, yeah, 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 that's so, right, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so that's what I say, is it, is it a necessary? No, in, in 2021, the Steadicam is a very common instrument. Back in 1990, my son was born in 93. Yeah. 90, this was 90, 90 89, 90, in yeah. Summers Bay. Yeah. Um, there, w there was only, you know, maybe six people in the United States that were um, adroit enough to do it. This might be a little bit of an abstract question, but and it can be for both of you, um, but I came up focus pulling and operating and now I'm shooting. Was there ever a moment where uh, you found yourself really having to let go? I mean, if you're watching a monitor, maybe it's more for Anastas, but like now that you're shooting, um, when somebody is, you want the operator to be, you know, representing you creatively, that how did you let go basically? Was there a moment? No, I don't think it was a question of letting go. Um, I think you collaborate, you know, and so obviously, so what happened for me personally was to work with people, operators who had the same skill set that I could recognize, because I, you know, like Philippe, he operated his own camera, so he knew exactly what the instrument could do, you know. Um, so it wasn't any of the, you know, like, oh, it's too tech. He mentioned something, well, that's a hard shot. Yeah, well, still, you know, it's a hard shot. You recognize that. So it wasn't about letting go of composition because I think part of the, um, the joy of collaboration is the discovery of the other. The joy of listening to somebody go, well, what if you do it this way? makes a penny drop and you shift a point of view. Now, as a camera operator, I, you don't have the um, luxury of prep with a director and a DP, but you do have the, 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 the spontaneity of the moment, which 
goes back to not just the technical side, but it goes like to, huh, if you have a great idea for the roundy roundy, be careful when you pitch it, you know, because, and be careful who you pitch it to, because if you pitch it to the director, who goes, God, that's absolutely brilliant. And then all of a sudden the DP goes, yeah, but I'm keying from that side with all the stands and all that sort of stuff. So it was less about an, it was more working with people whose work I admired and go, oh yeah, that's really a great way to think about this, you know, because if Felipe never, we were talking about this earlier, he never really showed me a frame. It was, here's a 50 mil, I put the left hand corner on the tree you know, and then through the process of the first three days we worked together and maybe the first, thing, the first week, it clicked as to what the tone of the film was. Um, but I have hired the wrong operator and want to drop in. Yeah, for sure, that has happened. It happened recently on a Marvel thing where the director finally looked at me and, I, and it was like take 14 or something. And I finally said, okay, just, uh, just okay, hang on. <laughs> then I jumped in and, you know, because it, it's like, you know, it's, it's muscle memory, you know, it comes back. You know, I said, one rehearsal and I'll do it. So, yeah, I have made that mistake. No question? Yes, right oh, sorry. Yeah. So this question is directed to Mr. Rosolo, please. So that uh, uh, when you started your career, I think I'm right if I assume that you operated by yourself. So can you tell something about this uh, period when you started to use operators, what it demanded from you? Was it easy to, uh, well? Um, you know what, um, there is a, a physical or mental pleasure into operating, which, which at one point I abandoned uh, because it, too big film, film's too big and too much work and, and also because Finally, one day you recognize that there are people that are even better than you are. Um, so, uh, and also I started, you know, working in France where there was no question the, 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 the DP was the, the one operating. There was no money to pay somebody else. So, uh, and also the other thing is that it was extremely good for me, at least, to look at, at the shot with the, through the viewfinder. Because we, when I started, uh, there was not even a tab, a video tab, not even a black and white video tab. It came only like several years after I started the shooting. So the, in order to be in, to have your, your head and your mind into the film was basically to operate. Um, so, it was part of the job. You did operate and you did the light and you were lighting with your eye on the, uh, on the eyepiece of the camera because that's where you got the best idea of what the contrast would, would give you, with a little bit of experience, much better than when you look with the naked eye. Now you look at a monitor and you say, okay, well, I, there's too much contrast, not enough contrast, and then you, you, do, you do whatever's needed. But at the time, it was a way of lighting by looking through the eyepiece. And also it was, you know, smaller film, smaller budget, therefore, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of, um, you know, press everything into one, basically. Um, and I still like to operate once in a while, but, you know, what I don't like is to do like 45 takes, you know, with the same thing, because I, really, I get bored very easily. Um, and then now I, uh, I'd rather not operate because the other thing also <laughs> that changed everything is that now the director is in a tent somewhere uh, away from the camera. So basically if you operate, and I operated a film a few years ago because I wanted for several, for specific reasons, small film, and then the pain of it was like getting after each take, because you have to discuss with the director, so you jump out of the dolly, you run, you run uh, you know, half a mile to get to the tent, and then uh, you run back to the dolly because you have to, you know, the sun is going down, and, and it's exhausting, you know. In the first days, the director was by the camera. You know, you had 
the, the camera, the operator, the DP, when there was a DP not operating, the continuity person, yeah, and the director like, like a group. So basically the information went it's fast. Now it's just, where is he? Okay, uh, when he's not at the editing room. Um, so it, it's, it becomes exhausting to operate and shoot at the same time, just for that stupid physical reason. Um, and you know, when on, on big budget, it's, it's not, it doesn't make any sense. And when you, sh when you have like three, four cameras on the set, uh, uh, then you can't operate all four of them. So, and then you, you have the operators to try to coordinate, uh, are you in shot, are, am I in shot, do I do things like that? So it's, it's too much work. So you can't, I can't physically, mentally uh, operate, uh, you know, uh, large production, but I miss it, really. Uh, well, my question is, uh, when do you guys uh, involve the operator in pre-production? And uh, what you were talking about of this relation with someone with a naked eye, uh, how much do you like to tell the operator or to just not give it information and have like this fresh point of view? Um, I'll start with that one because the invo I think the more involvement, the better. But it, we have to remember that we're working with budgets and there's a line item for that particular person. And invariably, you're bumping up against the line producer with, you know, I only have the operator here for one day of prep, and then they're on, you know. Um, I was really very lucky with Philippe because Philippe would bring me on early, um, particularly later in, in, in our relationship. Um, so for me, yes, it, it, it is important to, to bring somebody on and scout the locations. And for all the reasons of what I was saying, it's not just the aesthetic, but for all the reasons of, you know, well, it's not just the key grip that has to figure out whether the 50-foot technocrane on the back end is, you know, 13 feet long. And if I swing it around and he wants that shot, and will it bump and does the wall have to go? <laughs> you know, I mean, because those kinds of things, I'm... I'm well past trying to even figuring that stuff out, you know. So uh, for me, uh, the sooner the better on that. Um, and then talking about the framing, it's literally, I, I've been lucky enough to hire some great operators, so it's always just in general, general terms until we actually start shooting and then it, it gets defined. Yeah, because it, it's quite difficult to explain what a good shot is, especially when you don't have a set, the actors and the light, and, because everything is a combination of things. So you can you can babble, you know, forever and saying, "Well, I like this kind of composition," and then you take out an old rom rom painting, which of course is not even in the same format that you're going to shoot the movie, and that's a complete waste of time, you know. So uh, it's something that you build up. And actually quite quite quickly in the first day of, sh of shooting, and then sometimes you say, well, you know, I like this, there's an emptiness in, in the shot there, maybe we should fill it or, or reframe so we don't have that. You know, basically, because uh, framing is, uh, you, you could su uh, su uh, summarize, that's the word, summarize. yeah, summarize, uh, um, framing like uh, compiling information. When you see that as a process of giving out information, it makes th things very clear. Um, meaning what, everything that's not interesting in the frame, try to get it out and try to combine all the interesting elements in, in the frame. And you will notice, because I work with a, with a, now he's a old, old, was a more ancient director of John Borman. John Borman had this sense of uh, uh, making shots where 
information were, was fundamental. Uh, John Bowman used to, three months before, some, he, gave, he, gave, he was giving shots with the exact height of the camera, the exact move, and you could put chalk marks on the ground, like three months later when you come back after the scout, that's the shot you would do. And thinking of the shot, and you thought, right, that's very kind of bold to know in advance. But you, you knew that at this height, you would see the, foreground, the relation between the foreground and the background and an element in the middle. Every shot was about giving the right information. So when you have this thing in mind, it's easier to discuss aesthetical thing like composition because composition is, is an organization of information, basically. Yeah, I'm just going to pick up on that thought because um, having framed for Philippe and others, in the process for me always was to remove that which wasn't necessary in, 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 the, story, in the narrative. Um, and that which remained was then what the essence of that story was. At the same time, watching a performance by a close-up on an actor was informed by the actor and how what they were doing at that moment, you know, as opposed to the tableau of something else. So often we would look at a performance and uh, I would be framing something and Philippe would whisper something in, the ear, in my ear, because, you know, we were next to each other at the time, um, because it was in response to a, an emotional contact that an actor was doing. Whether it be short change, I, uh, headroom, um, the million of things where you can put somebody in a frame, you know? So that, there was, it was both the um, pre-planning and the intuitiveness of an emotional response to the instrument, the camera, and, and the performer. Um, that's an interesting thing you said. I, uh, I, when, when I had the occasion of working with very young operator or beginner or anything like that, felt they were nervous, especially at the time where you had to make sure the boom didn't get into the shot or nothing horrible would happen. And, and I used to say to the operator, you know what? I want you to tell me at the end of the take whether the actors are good or not. If you're capable of telling me whether the actors are good or not, don't worry about the mic, you're good. It's be, basically it depends on that, be in the movie. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a movie, be in the movie. And another thing that I demand from the operator, because sometimes the operator says, oh no, I want another take, what happened? Um, there's this thing that got into there at that point. And I say, no, you're not going to get another take because what bothers you now will never be in the, in the cut. So I don't care. It's not about the dailies where somebody say, hey, there's a, something bad there. It's never going to be in the cut. If you think about the shot, uh, you're on this actors while the other, the other says a line which is important. At that moment, you have this problem. No, you're going to be on the other one. And I want to add something about operating, and uh, you're certainly not going to um, contradict me on that. There's a, and, there's, and, and something that I encourage people, when they can, to have an experience. It's not a rule, but I've noticed that operator who had an experience of documentary had something, had a plus. And the reason is that when you do documentary, you have to think about the story you're going to you, you're going to tell. You have to think about the editing. I'm going to film this. That's a really interesting thing. But is it? How does how the, how will this shot, this piece of of of, of film, uh, will fit into the project? And I notice because I've no, I, I've I've worked with. The old generation of operators in England sometimes, where I'd operate where well, they were very good with the wheels, but they had no idea what the shot before and the shot after would be. They were just like very good operator in the sense of they would operate. You know, they would physically move the wheels perfectly as asked, but had no idea what what it was for. You know. 
the good relation between um, an operator and a DOP is they have a similar vision of what the final product will be. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, and um, I was a news cameraman before I got into features, um, which is, speaks directly to what uh, Philippe is saying, because that is a definitely a situation where what is the narrative and and how can I tell the story in the 30-second bite, you know, that's going to go on. Um, for sure, for sure. Uh, so I, no contradiction from me, saw at all. I know. <laughs> Otherwise, who knows what might, I might not get my next gig. There is a very. I had, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, where's the Where's the mic? Oh, yeah, sorry. You had a question, right? There you go. Uh, uh, I'll do it. Speak so loud, we can hear. We'll uh, yeah. Hello. No, oh. you, you'll be, I promise you'll be second. You'll, okay. be, you'll be next. <laughs> okay, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, that's good. No, can you find I, on the I, I'm the third name, but I'm going to have another question. He needs a little bit of, you know. You go, you have the mic, might as well. All right. Uh, yeah, so a, a bit of a different question. I, I was curious what, uh, what makes a bad operator, like what, what is something that might happen on set where you need to walk up to the producer and you're like, no, listen, this operator, like this is not working, we need a different guy. Like what is uh, a situation where an operator is just not working for you and you need to like replace him? Um, it happened to me once and, uh, and I, uh, no, I, I refuse to replace him. I, I think I should have done that. And it's for two reasons. I mean, he was, uh, not only he was not listening, he was contradicting me all the time, and and most of the time was wrong to do it. Uh, but also he was not good with his assistants. You know, he was not behaving. And I should have done that, but I don't. I didn't do it because there's nothing I hate more than um, firing someone. Uh, I, I don't think I've done, yeah, I know, there was an electrician that we got rid of, because, but, but because he was a liar, he said he could do things and he couldn't, but so that's, a, that's the only time I ever fired someone. I don't, I don't like the idea because, you know, it, it's hurting people, it's hurting their careers, and, you know, the mistake, you know, I remember <laughs> John Bowman again that saying, um, uh, he had an actor that was not good, okay? And at one point, the actress said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, uh, you know, it's, it's not working. And he said, no, you don't have to be sorry. I have to be sorry because I made the mistake of hiring you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but that is the point, I think, what, what Philippe just said, because um, it does speak to a, a judgment when you hired somebody. The, the, I have actually demoted an operator who I thought was ready to do a camera and um, who is now a, an amazing operator and head of the society of, you know, operators in, in the United States and blah, blah, blah. But he just wasn't quite ready to run the set. And so that was a, a situation. Um, the other one was what Philippe talks about is the lack of, the, the inability to take criticism, um, not personally, but to take a critical idea about the shot. Because again, it goes back to the shot, the shot doesn't have an ownership. It's either working or not working. And, and if it's not working, then we have to change it. And so therefore, if you are uh, upset that we're changing it because you came up with it, then possibly you've attached too much ego to it. And maybe we need to move on from that relationship. But for me, luckily, I've never had to either um, fire any buddy in the camera department, except I did ask them to do B camera, and I brought in, a, 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 and that worked out really well. Uh, and uh, neighbor asking, just uh, I'll pass it to our third neighbor, our third roommate afterwards. Uh, anyway, along, along the same line, a question is, uh, do you have to be a, I'm sorry for swearing, a dick uh, to be a great leader? No. Absolutely not. No. As in hard on, like, straight with your uh, crew? No. I mean, for a multiple reason. The first one being you should never be a dick to anybody unless you're, you're 
in a state of complete mistake and you lost, you're lost your mind. That, that, that can happen. I've been addicted probably without being wanting to be. But no, never at work, at home, anything, never. And secondly, it's not productive. I like to, I, I, first, I like to like the people I work with. I like the people to like me. I like to make them laugh and to have jokes and to have dinner with them because first, it's pleasant. Secondly, it's productive. People don't like to work under pressure, harassment, whatever. I mean, we, there's been a lot of talks about it lately and I totally agree, harassment or being just not nice with people is basically, by definition, not nice. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's obvious, it's so clear, it's so obvious. And that doesn't mean I'm a good guy. I just, it's just, it's just my philosophy. You know, you know, it's... And it doesn't mean that you don't have standards, you know? But it's exactly what Philippe said. And I think the more self-effacing you are, because as a DP, you've got an electric crew and a grip crew and a camera crew that all have to be cohesive somehow or other, you know? Um, although I do remember once I did ask Philippe, I said, why do you keep that person around? And he said, well, because you know what? The entire crew must dislike somebody. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I can't remember that. <laughs> no, I was joking. He was joking. I'm sorry. It was, it was, I don't even think it was him that said it, but it was a laugh. <laughs> now that I think about it, that's a, yeah, but I know people would do that. But, um, no, I mean, it's, you know what, it's, I had, a, I had the privilege that, that uh, I worked as much as I could with the same people. I like, and it's not about a principle, it's certainly, I work with people, and some people you, uh, you introduced to me, right. like, like yeah. Pam's here, oh, right. and the thing, right? and the same when I was in France, uh, I like to see the same faces, because, and also, I, after, uh, uh, you know, a while, you have the same language, you, you almost don't need to say anything, because it's obvious, you know, sometimes I gaffer, I work with a long time, and suddenly I do something, and, uh, and, uh, was in France and Jean-Pierre uh, Gaffer have been working for a long, 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 long time uh, in France. He tells me, Philippe, you'd never do that. Can you say, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't do it. <laughs> and just uh, before that, I'm gonna follow up with one thing on that, which speaks to the DP camera operator relationship and the collaborative relationship of people who you hire because that's basically what it is. And it's the thing to remember, which is when Philippe asked me, or I asked Philippe for a recommendation, it's never whether or not they're technically good. That, that is, tends to be the given. It's whether or not you like working with them and, and whether or not that process is there. You know, So if he's shooting in somewhere and I say, hi, who should I, do, who do you know? it becomes, who do I like, right away. It doesn't become, uh, this person was the most brilliant steady cam operator and whatever, or this person was that. It, it, it does codify itself into, who do, who do I like working with, what, what that is. And then it's, you know, because the other part for me is always a given, you know? Yeah, and actually, uh, to follow that, that uh, what you say, um, last thing I did was in South Africa where I didn't know any, anyone. Uh, I wanted an operator from the operator I knew and thing, but they were not available, so I had like no name for either uh, post. And I, I I called I called Tass, uh, who has experience in uh, in South Africa several times, and he gave me names. I took the names, I called the guys, and say, you know, you're the only you're the only one on my list. Do you want to do the job? So I didn't you know, I didn't tell you anybody. People were hired even before I saw them, because I trusted us, and because now we, we're so uh, equally minded that if he likes somebody, I know I'll, I gotta like him or her. Oh, they were fantastic. Yeah, that's 
Three. Thank you. Thank you. I had to have him say that because otherwise, you know, he's going to go walking out. And they were all idiots. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, it, it could be a bit more of an abstract question, but um, with all your experience in building teams now and working with different people and um, uh, what, if, if, you would, if you would go back, let's say f fresh out of film school, uh, oh, or, or not necessarily. Yeah. I go to finance. Yeah. <laughs> I hear crypto is really something I should get into. <laughs> where, uh, where would you start? What would you do? Your first steps. What would be your natural I don't, I don't know, career progression? Or where would you go to go into narrative filmmaking? Are you, are you speaking now? If I was to be clear, not back in early, you know, 1772 when I started, but somehow if yeah, this was yeah. happening in 2021, okay. what might be a career path yeah. to be, do what? To go to up to into narrative, oper into oper operate, into everything. ultimately up be a operating. DP, yeah. ultimately to, yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you go first. <laughs> Okay, it, of course, obviously, it's a difficult question because we are taking responsibility on orienting people's career and I, I definitely don't want to do that. I have an opinion on, on something which is basically based on my own story, is that um, you know, there's this normal path of going, you know, intern, lord, or second, third, and you know, one day it will be fifth, fourth, third, second, operator, and DP. And uh, when you follow this curriculum there, basically you end up like you're 55 when you first do your first, and that's, I've got nothing against people at 55 because I'm way over that, but uh, um, my luck was that I started being a DP at 26 or something, I can't remember exactly, so long, so long ago. Um, I think it's unfair for people to go through a long thing like that. And I'm very happy because I mentored a young, a young lady uh, recently and she just did her first um, uh, film as a DP right now after when I met her she was... Uh, at the, at the bottom of the, of the camera crew. So that's four years ago. Um, so what I would recommend, what I would really recommend is to, is put your hands on anything that's remotely or close to filmmaking, whatever situation. And when I started, I did, I had a few years where I was a loader with Nestor Almendros, who was my hero. He's still, still he's my hero. And at the same time, I was DPing films. You know, I was making money and learning my skill with the films I did with Nestor. And on the other end, I was shooting low-budget film for no money at all as a DP. So it was very weird to be both, you know, I could have had a... a, a um, a card, you know, like uh, Philip Ruslow, uh, third day, third day C slash uh, director, director of photography would be fun. I never thought about that. I didn't have the money to print cards anyway. Um, and I learned a lot by doing that, by going back and forth. So it, I don't think there's any uh, perfect path to achieve what you what you want, except shooting as much uh, as much as you can on any form of doing anything, you know, be close to a camera. Yeah, I, I agree with what Philippe is saying because um, it, it has to do with also, we're, we're in a business slash art form slash com commerce that we're looking to support ourselves using our craft. And um, that little word, support yourself, is 
it's different for everybody. Everybody has a different criteria about how they can live and what they can live and whether they have families and whether or not they're going to have, a, you know, a daughter or a son or the children, et cetera, et cetera. And that all plays into how this happens, you know. Um, what Philippe said about shoot anything you possibly can, I think, is the key to any to that, um, for sure. And whether or not you're a, a second AC and you're shooting um, whatever you're making, or you have the opportunity to, to oh, I can make a living at operating, you know, um, that will propel my expertise forward because I also can make a living at it. So there is no perfect path or any particular path. Um, one of the things I do say that I feel very lucky about, that as an operator, I had worked with some of the most, including Philippe, and I kid you not, the most um, amazing DPs, yes. absolutely. And um, what that meant was, though, that problem solving was a learned skill by watching a master problem solve. And what we do as a DPs is ultimately problem solve. When you show up on the set and it's not exactly the way it was supposed to be, you know, and like, uh, then it's all of a sudden up to you to walk around with Milos Forman and find a courtroom with like 12 benches in it and make it work, you know. And having that exposure was huge because it does speak to also um, how do you purport yourself? How do you have a mentor? How, how, how do you supposed to act in a leadership role? When is it, I've seen this gentleman hand in his light meter and literally walk to his car. Um, leaving a director, an actor, and a first AD because there was literally no light left and nobody wanted to hear him. You know, and he finally said, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Poof, boom, and down the hill he went. Um, and you know, they all looked at me and I was like, well, that's my guy, I'm walking after him. Um, but that, what that does though, it, it shows you particularly when you work with somebody of a caliber and of a kindness of how to purport yourself. So there's that part of the, the, the other side of the shoot everything that you can, but also, you know, the politics of a big set is a, is a learned thing. You know, rather than just, I can read that in a book. You know, how do I show up on that? Way back there. I see you. Uh, this gentleman and then all the way up there. So, uh, earlier you mentioned about the director. And you also mentioned about the role of the director to be used to be close to the camera which has changed, as uh, for example, John Booman said sometimes, that the actor is always acting to the director. It has changed quite a lot. I would like to hear your opinions and experiences about that. Uh, when you're closest to the actor, what happens? When you're closer to the actor, what happens? After um, the director as opposed to being in the monitor room. Having spent a career at the camera, um, and I was just telling this story the other day with Philippe. We were, we were reminiscing about making rain, and you're in the set, and you're getting rained upon with the actor, and everybody else is outside of that perimeter. <laughs> you know? There is an intimacy by being on set, I believe, and that's why many... I always had, my, as an operator, I always had my finger on the, on the trigger. On the, the Panavision, it's back here on the film. And uh, the director would call cut, and I'd be slow on the gate. I'd be slow on the cut. And I never wanted anybody to cut my camera. Because often, I was looking for that, that extra 12 frames when the actress was just coming off the shoulder or just looking off or just this word got into there. And that intimacy of being close um, was part of what drew me to filmmaking. You know, it's like, hmm, do I still operate? Yeah, if it's a musical piece, you bet I'm on the camera. You know, absolutely, you know, uh, because that's what drew me to the art. Um, and also as an operator, I always would pull my eye away from the eyepiece and I'd feel the actor look right through me and then look at the director who was right next to me, which meant that there was an intimacy there. And now I'm back at a video monitor somewhere and all that's like a little different. 
Yeah, no, we lost something there. And uh, I remember by when operating or when being um, um, being close to the camera, the first person that that the actor's looking when she or he hears cut is the camera. The man at the camera, or the man close to the camera. And you're right, and then at the director. Because as uh, operators or DP, but yes, operators, you're the first spectator, you're the first audience. And w you have a position which is, unless you're a dick, uh, which is uh, benevolent, which is, you know, we love actors. I love actors and actresses. Um, don't laugh. Um, <laughs> um, I said it, no, it's, just, it's a joke. Um, we love them and we're not, not in, in a way in a critical way like the director is. The director is thinking about telling his story and he has a vision of how the actors want. We, we, we just love actors so, and we look at them with love. I mean, I mean it's, it sounds a little bit you know, cheesy, but, it, no, but it's true. It's true. And then the actors, they know that. And basically, we are the, fir the first to be emotional when an actor does something that is emotional and I always find that it's necessary for an operator or anybody on the crew but you know you're in very critical position as an operator uh, and sometimes also for the DP it's always nice to send a message a message of appreciation to the actors um, that you like what they're doing Unless you don't like it, but that's a different thing. But that's, that's a bad, bad situation. Um, and without being critical. Yeah, I think Philippe's point is really interesting because as a DP, as an operator, I used to talk to the talent, the actress or actor, far more after a take in terms of what my appreciation would be. Like, okay, we're moving on, and I would be like, that was really good. That really, that I, you know, and, and it was just taken as that. As a DP, I was already off and running, going, okay, turn around, uh, 12K goes off, and we'll put the thing in the window, and that thing. There was a, an, a, a, an intimacy of collaboration there that was totally unspoken, but still very elementary um, when, you're at the, when you're at the camera. So I don't know if that answered your question. There's a gentleman all the way up there. Oh God, guys, you need the long lenses over there because uh, we're we're like ants. Uh, Hi, good evening. Huh? <laughs> yeah, actually, I'd like to ask, uh, as cinematographers, when hiring camera op camera operators, how much do you reconsider your decision when you know that the operator is at the same time operator slash DP? Uh, because from my experience, at at a certain uh, point of my career, I decided to to remove everything related related to cinematography from my website or social media pages because I had an experience that the DP had reconsidered his decision yeah, when he knew that I'm working question. as a DP at the same time. Yeah, it's Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Faris Korbani, camera operator, special ACO, SOC, camera operator specialized in Trinity and Steadicam. Okay, cool, <laughs> great, okay. Send the number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, That's I mean, mine. it's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, I never, yeah, I never had this, this, this opportunity to have to hire someone who was. No, that's not true. Actually, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did operators. We, we did, we did. Uh, otherwise, we did. Um, no, I'm not. Yeah, absolutely. Was, I had a, an operator I work with, and he was, uh, he was, and he ended up like doing um, second unit uh, shots and, uh, and sequences. So. No, I, personally, I think it's a benefit because then anyone with an experience of uh, photography and the lighting and things like that, you know, you, 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 can, you can put it at your use. And, but I remember that the, actually the only film that I did as an operator, the only feature film I did as an operator with a DP that was, by the way, a friend of mine, but 
and a colleague because I was already doing a film as DOP. And uh, it was great because you could, you know, you, you, you the, the communication was e even easier. Uh, you know, he would ask you to say, do you think you, is that, I think that, uh, I like the operator sometimes telling me that something is hurting his eyes, as you know, like, uh, and sometimes I ask, you think you're, uh, what do you think, this is too bright over there, or thing like that. It, it's nice to have this kind of collaboration, because it's always interesting to have a critical opinion of what you do from somebody that you trust. Right. I think the more the question is for me is if you're an operator trying to be a full-time DP, how do you define yourself? Because um, so my story is working with Philippe, there was a small little film up in Canada. Uh, Jake Ebers was the producer. Jake and, and Philippe had worked together. It was a tiny, tiny little movie. Uh, and Philippe throws out my name. I go up to Canada and I shoot this little tiny movie uh, as the Steadicam operator, operator, and DP. Um, it's a small, small film, so it doesn't have any cachet or anything, and uh, I go back to operating. Um, and I'm like, oh, I'm glad I didn't give up my Steadicam because you know, I have a gig to go to because uh, I forget what we were doing. And I, and I spent another two or three years as an operator with this tiny little film out there. Um, and we're down in Florida together, and Philippe, I asked Philippe, is he, is he gonna do the Milos Forman's next movie? Because we had already done one together, and he had to go to France to do something. And it's literally coming out of dailies when we had this wonderful thing called dailies, which was, which I think was the beginning of the end of the collaborative process, because dailies was being able to sit in a group and look at the day's work and be able to discuss it and think about it and figure out what you can do the next day. That notwithstanding, Philippe just shot me a look across the way and goes, no, I'm going back to France. We were getting into two separate cars to go to dinner. And I just literally said across the car, well, tell him I'll shoot it. And then we went off to dinner with David Dotson from Panavision. Cut to, at the end of that same movie, my phone rings. Um, and it's Michael Hausman, the producer that we had worked with. And he said, can you come to New York after you're done to meet Milos? And I was like, oh yeah, sure, yeah, I'll come up. And I go to Milos, Hausman's big hug and kiss, and because we had done like a film together. And um, I said, so what are, what are you doing, you know? And um, he pulls out the bottle of Petrus, and he goes, oh, I'm gonna do this film on Andy Kaufman. And I said, oh, are you shooting it in anamorphic? And he said, I'll never forget, you tell me you're the cameraman. And what had happened, and I finally got this story from Philippe last night, because I'd always surmised, and I always knew, and I've actually acknowledged his mentorship, but what had happened was, um, Philippe had called Milos and said, you know, this guy's ready to, to shoot this movie, why don't you take a chance? The reason I bring up this story is cut two, that's when I got rid of my Steadicam. <laughs> Um, because at that point, I was going to be dealing with a director who, from then on, I knew had to, I had to define myself in a room as a director of photography, not as a camera operator slash director. Because the, the the DPs that were going to hire me didn't really in as long you know they didn't care if I shot a small movie or not. It was like oh he's really good we'll work with him. But from a director's perspective, then all of a sudden I was I needed that validity. So, so you mean that I have no chance to get a job as an operator? Now? None at all. But, and also, what's really great is he has not asked for his 10% of every salary since then. <laughs> no, I asked for 15, but you, but you, you, you turned me out. You didn't want to. Um, has there ever been... Um, uh, disagreement between you two in a movie set, not in a bar or somewhere, but... Yeah, yes, yeah, about the, the, who was picking the bill when we get to the restaurant. <laughs> no, uh, I, I... Probably, but I don't remember any of it. 
Do you remember any of it? To be honest. Yes, there have absolutely been disagreement, and um, <laughs> and and certain people have dis expressed their displeasure um, quite clearly. The disagreements only come from the fact when. I, as an operator, wasn't looking at the entire picture. It's never been a disagreement about the shot, the what thing, or the how, the thing, because it was always understanding what his vision was, and I was along f with that. There, and it never happened on set. It always would be afterwards, like, why did you take so long to do that if you knew it was going to take that long, mm -hmm. you know? If you knew it was gonna take that long to put the dance floor down, you should have said something, because when I turned around and I saw the plywood coming in and I was expecting to be ready, and I already gave, I'll be ready in 10, and five minutes later there's plywood coming into the room, that disconnection of communication is what causes the disagreement, not the fact that, oh God, he wanted to shoot it on a 50 and I think it's a 75, or, you know, or the framing thing, or anything like that, so, yeah. No, but that's, yeah, no, that kind of disagreement you, you're bound to have, it's unavoidable, and on top of that, you know, sometimes there's so much pressure on the set that you, and I first, you know, be I'm sometimes unfair uh, in those discussions because uh, I'm under pressure or just because I panic because I don't know exactly what I want to do, which is how it happens also. And then you have somebody to, you pick somebody to pay, to pay for it. Um, no, but that's unavoidable. What's it important is that we disagree, we, I wouldn't say fight, but we disagree, somebody wins the, agree, the, the discussion, and then, and then you forget about it. What's important is just like you don't bear a grudge or you don't keep that uh, a bad feeling because, yeah, that's bound to happen with yeah. anybody in and any it, situation. And it was never, like I said, it was never creatively. It was always about the Your technique, yeah. the time management part of something. Because, you know, the creative part is already, you know, it's already discussed We during the, during the day. We're all on the same page creatively. And on top of that, I've got a, I've got a really a, a bad side to me, which I'm very impatient. I get bored very quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm getting better, by the way. You don't know that, but... Um, and so sometimes I'm a bit unfair, you know, so why, why this 300 meter track is taking more than four minutes, you know. Uh, this side. That's, that's quite a physical, great physical exercise you're doing, huh? Wow. You you have your phone with the number of steps and kilometers and things. Oh, sorry. No, so, excuse me. Go ahead. So, hi, I'm Christian uh, from Slovakia. I study in Hungary, mm -hmm. and um, I I was uh, thinking about what are your thoughts about uh, this industrial standard that when a DOP is a DOP, then there uh, he's not an operator, but Hungary standards standards are like uh, if you are a DOP you are an operator as well. So you are a main operator on set as well when you are a DP. So what are your thoughts about it? It's, it's like an old school uh, problem because today's standards are like uh, you have to uh, take part uh, in, in the preset uh, thinking and, and everything like that and you don't touch the camera because you have a lot of things in your head. But uh, what are your thoughts about, so the, b between the two, uh, standards. So, as a DP and an operator, or as a DP and do not touch the camera. What is what are the main differences? Uh, what are you thinking? Thank you. I, I would say that it's 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 it can be a, a, a personal uh, decision. You know, I know um, uh, DP like uh, Bob Richardson operates all his films, and I think Roger Dean does that too. No, I think. Uh, Roger does, which means in the United States either you get a, a, a authorization from the local 600, which is the union, because they don't like it for employment reason, it's very understandable, uh, or they hire somebody that stands by, another operator is paid for uh, doing nothing. Um, no, which which I, I personally would hate to do, because if I got somebody that stands by uh, doing nothing, I say, well, 
do something, take the camera, you know. Just, but um, it's more a question, it's a, it's, sorry, it's a personal question. You know, I totally understand Roger and Bob doing that. I'm not doing it because I think it's too much work, uh, honestly. And I think I can benefit for, from specialized, uh, from operators that are more, well, they're better than me, basically, that's it. Um, and then it's also a question of budget, it's a question of, uh, of time. Uh, so it, I don't have a definite opinion on, on, on your question. I don't think it's an old fashioned thing versus a modern one. Uh, it's just a question of circumstances and, and uh, idiosyncrasy. I mean, you, who you are, what you want to do. If you want to operate and shoot in the same, and uh, DP in the same time, and you can manage the, the 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 whole thing fine it's great yeah i think um particularly in the united states there's a historical context to it uh which has to do with the 1940s and how films in hollywood and cameras evolved so basically when you know before the 40s and 30s and, the, and 40s 30s and 50s there were huge cameras huge Mitchells that were in blimps that that's where the geared wheel came from and everything else that came with that so that idea of a specialized uh, person who could deal with a 250 kilo camera while somebody else was lighting and the director of said photography made perfect sense you know because it and so within the historical context in the United States, the camera position has always been in the guild and the union. We have to remember that this is a business and there's always the producers looking to make the dollar or whatever last, the Zolti last longer. So there's a, there's a conflict and a clash between what do we really need versus what you have had historically. And as cameras were smaller and became 16 mils and the eclairs and the, all that other stuff that went with it, the idea of DP as operator came forward. Because up until then, to be a feature film, I mean, you started with a hand crank, but you know, pretty much every movie from David Lean backwards uh, was a huge crew of equipped people, like five guys to pick up a camera and the whole nine yards. So um, my sensibility is I, like Philippe, like to have an operator because I actually like the freedom of not having to do it. I used to be so bored at times that I used to call for the wheels because if I lean too much on the eyepiece, I'd pan. <laughs> Because, you know, you're got sitting there on the wide shot and it's, you know, and it's middle of the night and you're exhausted and you're thinking, well, what am I doing here besides just making sure that the, you know, the mic is out of the frame because I got the wide shot, you know, so, and, I, and I'm lighting, no, I don't need to do that. Um, so, my sensibility is operator and, uh, like I said, you know, if I, if, and operate when I, when I want to. Just, uh... Oh, yeah, it's the sun, it's the sun. So, uh, one more question. Um, what were the toughest um, situation when, when you had to maybe sacrifice something or, or you had uh, an instruction from the director that you have to move the camera ways that you, you knew that it won't really, it, it, it isn't uh, possible, or it won't happen like the director said? Or, or what was the, the, the most uh, difficult thing, thing to make and then uh, you, you changed something uh, and, and it worked out better than it was actually planned? I, um, in my operating days, I operated, most, but my most difficult film to operate was a film called What Dreams May Come which was uh, directed by Vincent Ward and it was uh, Robin Williams. It's a wonderful looking film. Um, but I, I do clearly remember having a total disconnect with the director. Uh, Eduardo Serra was the DP and Eduardo was pretty much out of the picture for most of that movie. Um, just, he just was doing his own thing. And I remember the director wanting a point of view and uh, with a, a, a steady cam shot, and I sh did the rehearsal, and he cut, and he said, "Where's the nose?" 
and my face did what your face did. I said, the nose, and I went to Vincent, I swear to God, and I looked at him, and he was slightly cross-eyed. And in his world, the nose should be in a POV. Oh my God. But, and I say that, it would be useful. And I say that because it was the most difficult part was not the technical aspect of it, but was understanding what the concept was. You know? Yeah, right, that one. You sent me that fantastic uh, New York New Yorker cartoon with the rhino. Rhinos, yes, I did. That was rhino, me. The oh. rhino painter. And all his painting, there's a thorn in the middle. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> I did send that to you. Yeah, that was the nose thing. Oh, fantastic. So, um, so technically, for me, technically, uh, as a DP, there's always been a technical challenge for a particular shot, and it's been discussed and ripped apart, and, you know, could, do we have the money to do it? Is it a morph? Is it whatever? You know, but for most part, the difficulty lies in the lack of understanding of concept. Like, that was so far apart in terms of conceptual ideas about what that meant. You know, and that and the same director, when I would walk back to one, uh, would want me to roll the camera on the trees as I was going back because they looked ethereal and nice. But anyway, that was my thing. How about yours, Philippe? Any shots? No, I mean this 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 kind of situation happens all the time where um, uh, uh, it's a question of language. You know, it's like I um, I remember it's not it's not a director I work with, but I was. Uh, there was a, um, a cameraman, he, he was laughing at a director because the director um, wanted a close-up but head to toe. So, of course, it, yeah, that makes you laugh. And then, but when I, I thought about it and then I looked it up and I, the, this director was a theater director. And a close-up for a theater director is somebody that comes at the front of the stage. Then you can see his face, but he's still head to toe because you see the entire, you know, it's the human vision, you, you choose what you want to see, to see. So it was not that stupid. And if that DP or cameraman or whatever it was had thought about it, he would have at least understood something, that the guy was not an idiot, he was just, talking about a feeling of proximity, and then you could have translated that in, well, it's probably 24 millimeter rather than 180. So you have, it's that difficult thing of understanding other people's language. It's not just because they speak Chinese and you, you speak, uh, let's say, Hungarian. It's each, each, individual, especially in the film business, they have their own language, which is a way of, of expressing their feelings or their vision. And you have to make the effort of understanding why, what language those people think, uh, speak. Test. Ken from Japan. I also has a news background, news and documentary background, news cameraman for nine years, and as you. But um, when when I go to news scene, or you you go to news scene, you think about how to start the news. What is that? beginning intro shot, what is the ending shot, you think about the sequence in your mind, there's a, like a room of creativity uh, on your own, depending on, oh, yeah, which is on your own decision, right? But versus you are trying to realize his request, DP's, uh, the, the vision of DP, who is trying to realize the director's <laughs> vision, so you feel like and the, the, the request is like a moving camera from A to B, right? Don't you feel like when you're sitting on, uh, behind the camera, feel like you're part of a very little mechanical part of a big machine? Or like uh, not really given the 
you know, the creativity, creative decision? Or is that, or, you, or you're lucky to meet someone like him who give you room to make your own decision? Or like, is it, is it something to injure the process to go up to DP? Or, or is it just creative enough job? How, how did you feel? Well, I think as a DP, I'm a very small part of a very large machine. <laughs> You know, it's just that the parts are different, you know? I mean, as a DP, you have to understand who the editor is and the director, and the first questions I ask in prep is, for example, what music are we playing? What were you thinking about when you wrote this script? Did you have a soundtrack in your mind when you wrote? All those pieces that make up the collaborative art of filmmaking is, to, you know, is recognized, did the producer think this was the script when they bought the script or did they rewrite the script and all those kinds of questions. Uh, so the idea of feeling that I was a minuscule part of a process because I was only operating the camera, the thing about when you operate a camera is you're a performer. You know, if I was a DP and I jiggle and nothing happens, if, 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 when you are performing on a handheld shot, you are literally taking your emotional context and you're putting it on a screen. How fast you boom up, how fast you boom down, how fast you take the hand, how to move it around, how fast is the steady cam shot, am I moving in, am I moving am I slight lower? All those are intuitive sensibilities, which is what the question was, gets back to what do we feel like when we give up that? And what you feel like is a, a tremendous sense of joy when you see somebody else realize that. You know, I mean, just to watch, a, I mean, I love working with certain operators. It's like, a, man, they just got that moment so great. You know, they, they understood it. They understood the timing. They understood the, like it's asking a dolly grip, does he feel like he's just a little part of it? And I'm like, well, no, he's the one that stopped the dolly at the right time. So that's my, my sensibility to how does it feel to, to be just doing that? Because I don't believe it's just doing that. You know, it's, yeah, you're basically first violin. You know, you, you miss your tempo and your <laughs> the orchestra goes south. Yeah. Yeah, totally, uh, nothing, nothing to add. It's, it's perfect. It's perfect answer to your question. I think. Um, hey, I was curious about your opinion on uh, directors and DOPs in uh, high budget uh, films. Um, people that do both? People who do both? Yes, exactly. L you mean like directing and DP? Yes. Yeah, the, no, uh, the, this, uh, Alfonso Cuarón did uh, Roma, but didn't... Yeah, but he had... He had um, yeah, help, okay. No, it's a different... Yeah, I mean, do you know what? I don't, I don't have a specific opinion. Uh, if they want to direct and, and DP also, it depends what the film is, and if they can do it and do it be well, why not? I mean, it's, it's, it's a missed opportunity for someone to do it, but uh, I don't have a problem with that. It happens very rarely because I think it's too much work, period. I've done a film as a director, and believe me, I, I was very glad to give up the, the job to a friend of mine, DP, because I could not have done it. Period, and I and and in the end, I was happy not to do it because suddenly I would focus on directing the actors, you know, making the story alive and things like that. And on top of that, I had like tons of other problems uh, due to uh, mismanagement. But um, but yeah, in theory, why not? Um, you know, there's a wonderful uh, director who I work with on Terre Haute called Alain Cavalier in France. In, in, in the past 20 years, he's done all his film on his own. But it's very, very personal. It's, it films like Diaries, and I totally understand that he does, he does not need anybody. He has a small camera, and he films whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and it's fine. You know, uh, and he does a very good job at it. But you know, it, as you say, there's very, very few examples of that. I think part of it is, um, 
again, for, for me and film, the creative process is the collaborative process. Exactly. And by collaborating with somebody, it allows you to look at a perspective from a different way. And then as a, you know, and so you have the choice to go with it or not go with it, but you don't know what you don't know. You know, so if, all, if you bump up against creative uh, friction, that tends to, and I'm just saying tends to, make something different. It tends to evolve something, an idea. Because as DP and directors, so often we've sit and sat across a table and an idea has evolved because it's gone, well, what if? And then the return is, well, what if? And then the other return is, what if? And then you end up, well, that's pretty crazy. Let's not do that. But what happens when we back up two steps? You know, so that's sort of a sensibility. And, and there are filmmakers like uh, Rodriguez, for example, who, you know, um, he does, um, he edits, he shoots, he uh, does the music, um, costume, well, he doesn't do costumes, but you know. Um, catering, 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 he does, he does catering, craft yeah. service, and drives the honey wagon. Yeah. Um, um, so, but it's a, you know, it's like, it, that's, do I want to work with that person? Not necessarily, no, because I'm here to be collaborative in And that, in that actually is, is the whole point of this our thing. our little yeah. little circus act now. It's it's just because we love the principle and the and the the collaboration. And because fundamentally cinema doesn't work without collaboration. And 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 when I had this idea of, of discussing relation between DP and operator and my little note I did for the camera image, it, it can be, the ideas can be extended to other member of the camera crew, to uh, collaboration with, with, with gaffers gaffer. and electricians, grips, uh, and with costume people, you know, makeup, uh, uh, sets and everything. It's cinema is essentially a collaborative that. If you don't like it, then I say, well, go to painting or um, finance. Yeah, finance is, finance finance is, is good. good. You can do that on a computer. Can we do, what yeah. did I say? Crypto. Go to crypto. Um, good evening. Um, I would like to hear more about uh, the way you discuss camera movements between you two and with uh, the grips, especially when they need some uh, particular rigging or things that have to be um, uh, thought much in advance. Can I, um, oops, sorry, because you, you, just so I can clear on the question, you want to hear more about the collaborative process, collaborative process between grips and camera movement? Uh, no, between you as an operator and uh, you as a DP to um, to set some uh, complicated yeah. movements when you need to, or just to uh, get the the um, the idea of the movements when it's. Uh, you know, it's, it's, okay. it's actually, as far as I remember, the collaboration, it's, we discussed that. Okay, what we've seen the rehearsal with the actors. Um, I'm thinking about a specific film, and then the director goes back and reads his paper and waits until we're done. Um, and then we say, okay, well, what do we do? <laughs> and then it's an exchange of, of uh, okay, but well, we could do that. Uh, and uh, because then if we do that, if we move from here to there, then we can see this, and that's an important point, story point that we see this at this moment. And uh, yeah, do you remember she or he was walking that way, so it would be nice to see his face at that point, meaning that you have to travel with it. And we have this kind of discussion, and then actually very quickly we, we come to a... Um, it's it's a com it's it's a common decision basically, but you know what? It depends uh, enormously on who's the director. Is some directors they would tell you what the shots are. Absolutely. And then you just figure out like we figure out, or you figure out, or the operator figures out. Sorry, not you. The operator figures out with <laughs> with the we with the key grip uh, how how to build the, you know to to do it, and. Um, 
And sometimes I've done I've done films, a few films with Neil Jordan. Uh, the beginning, not the one we did together, uh, where there was it was a different system, it was a kind of Irish British system where basically the the director and the operator were were the one to decide the shots, and you would look from the side, from the bench, you know, like, and then you could, of course, in, uh, interfere with that. But because it was Neil Jordan with, who had worked with Mike Roberts for years, and they had this kind of connection, so they would discuss the shots, and, um, and after that, okay, well, I'll do, you know, I liked it. And if I don't, didn't like it, I sometimes came in and said, it's not a shot, <laughs> and then we we'll dis rediscuss that. But that didn't happen very often. And then when we worked with Neil together, there was a different method. So it's it's also has to do with the the history of of filmmaking in in various countries. Yeah, I mean, what he said. <laughs> sure. I just want to say that. Much of those kinds of decisions are done in prep because in prep you tend to go with a director and look at a space and imagine actors or if you're lucky enough you have an actor there or I tend to, with the directors I work with, uh, act out the parts. How many steps will it take to go from here on this thing and what are you thinking in that, in that, that sort of sensibility? But um, the on-the-day moments of what it is, it tends to be very um, spontaneous because you're thinking of the same thing at the same time. You tend to be standing next to each other, watching a rehearsal, and that informs that decision. So it's a rare occasion where somebody, you feel the movement, and then you go, well, now we're going to make it static. You know, it tends to be organic. It's like jazz. You know, somebody's got the lead and then you hear where the solo's going and you're just going to take it over. Uh, I have a quite particular question for prepping your days. So I just come off my first uh, operator job like with more than 60 days. And I actually experienced the DP being very busy every morning with the gaffer, with the ACs. Everybody was like working quite busy and the operator, you're there. You don't have a steady cam on you. What do you do? Like, how do you um, prep your day before the first rehearsal? How can you contribute for the process uh, collaboration? I would um, show up late and go home early. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I don't mean to be flippant, but um, there's much to do. You know, there's much to do in talking about the, talking to the director about and the DP. It's it seems to me that whenever I've worked with as, as an operator, and again, 20 years ago, um, it was a triumvirate. It was a DP director, and I was listening to that conversation and then contributed to it. It was never a separate, you know, thing, you know, unless the night day before it was, okay, we'll start off the wide shot with that corner, and I'd look at Philippe and say, uh, 27, and have it on the finder, and he would say, you know, I know what a 27 looks like. And because uh, we did, you, you speak the same language, so you don't even have to share eyepieces or, or viewfinders. We would just throw out a number and the number would make sense because we speak the grammar of film and the grammar of photography. So I never found myself bored, you know. It was, um, there was something to do, either get the camera ready, because he was lighting, or, um, you know, or, something was good at craft service. Uh, do you have some problem with uh, Steadicam shooting, uh, with uh, work with director? Because director uh, want something to move me, something to stand, and when you're shooting in 12 hours, your performance is going to low. And uh, what is your advice to work with director and you need time to rest. You know, having been a fairly solid city cam operator, and I'm, uh, I'm actually not, not to be humbled, having been a really good city cam operator, um, one of the things I always avoid and is using it as a, as a verb. A steady cam is a noun. So when somebody says to me, we'll just steady cam it, it doesn't mean anything. 
So how do I avoid the idea of being in a steady cam for 12 hours? Well, it's, it's, it's a noun. So what is the verb of the shot? What is the idea behind the shot? So you only need to move, you know, three meters in this? Well, why are we doing it this way? You know, so, it, it, and as an operator and as a steady cam person, I would speak up and say, well, that's not the right piece of equipment um, to do that. You know, like, you know, and Philippe, I have to say, would be this, he would describe a shot and then it would be, do you want to do it on Steadicam? And I go, mm, Steadicam on a dolly, that's probably the way to go, right? Okay, yeah, because we're going to hit that bump and then we're going to be a long take at the end. And, you know, so we would, you know, I would make, I would be a virtuosity enough in the pieces of equipment to be able to put it together to figure out the shot that he was looking for. Because if I just said yes, you know, I'd once again still have that guy hauling me up the hill backwards, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on day one. No, the, the Steadicam thing, I mean, what it sounds like, what you're describing, is that um, the, the director that doesn't want to do, to break down the scene in specific shots or and, uh, doesn't know what to do and, uh, and, and says, well, Steadicam is, yeah, well, Steadicam, it means like, basically, uh, we don't make decisions. Uh, and that's the wrong thing because it ends up being a, bad study cam shot. And I've known that from my very early days where when I worked some films with director that basically didn't have a clue how to break down their scenes. And they said, oh, I great, I've got a great idea. We're going to do it handheld. Okay. Handheld. Why? Oh, yeah, I know. Because it's more like a POV thing. Whose POV is that? No, no, it's not that. It's what I mean. It's more natural. Uh, there's nothing natural in shaking the camera, you know. It's just, uh, uh, no, no, it's not. When it's more more immersive, and then I stop short of saying, well, if you're not cap capable of immerse your audience in your story, it's not the camera is not going to do it. You know, so that's when you have real problem with the with the with the directors is when they want to hide their incapacity. Somebody laughing there, but it, it's it's it it's that's the way it is. Okay, um, uh, with uh, help here in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Behind him. Uh, on like on Steadicam shots, when like after the first rehearsal or the first shot, the Steadicam isn't like you want it to be. How do you uh, talk with a Steadicam operator, like on corrections, like what, like yeah. Like, how, uh, how do you talk with them? With the steady cam operator when I'm not happy with the shot? Yes. Um, well, I tell him, you know, I'm not happy with the shot. <laughs> no, but... No, I mean, when, when you do that, you have to know why you're not happy, unha why you're unhappy with the shot. And, if you're, and, and you have to be able to express what, what's wrong with the shot. And sometimes you design the shot, so it's your problem. It's not the Steadicam operator's problem. But if right, and the same, th to pick up on that thought, it is absolutely, it's two questions. Is there the skill level there? That's question number one. So I am happen to be lucky because I know what it can do. <laughs> but even when I was doing the shot, is the shot because I had the skill level, is the shot designed correctly? You know, and that's two separate questions to, to answer. So if you are not satisfied with the shot, first ask yourself, does the person executing it have the skill level to do it? And if they do, then it's a collaborative effort to understand why. Do you want them to rotate around the doorway a certain way? Do you want them to hold back a certain time? Do you want them to, you know, um, a counter? Do you want them to decide where the radius of a, of a shot is? You know, if I'm rotating around this thing on this radius, or am I rotating around it out here? Am I keeping this on the left side of my frame? Or am I centering it and choosing what its lead is? And those are all just plain operating issues if the skill level is there. It's just literally how do you want to compose it? And that's, that's uh, they're collaborative yeah. between. Yeah, and, but it's, it's the same thing with a dolly shot. Or Absolutely, any kind of it just happens to be, it just happens to go up a set of stairs or it happens to go into a room. It just happens to be expanded, that's all.
Um, once everything is prepped and set and ready to shoot, um, as a DP, as an operator, how do you keep um, being active with the reality you're shooting and just not get mechanical with re with the journeys and and for the whole project? How do you keep being in touch with what you're shooting? Well, the, the, you know, when the, whatever is prepped, I mean, sometimes you prep a shot a long time in, in advance or a day ahead or even two hours before shooting, and uh, and then you execute the shot, and you 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 have to remain very critical of what it is, and you know, does the emotion get through? Do I like it? Can I? Is this going to work? So every time you you should be able to reinterpret. Reinter whatever you've seen, you know, even between takes, sometimes you need to, um, to make adjustments. I mean, the, the answer to that is you, you have to, you know, drink a lot of coffee and, and keep, keep awake, you know, keep yourself awake. Yes, I think it's the, if you're asking how do you stay interested, it's the same way you stay interested if you are practicing a piece of music you look at technique it's the same way you stay interested as if you just wrote something and you have to rewrite it 20 times and decide whether that's the right verb or a different verb the crap the, the work of the shot is not in the creation of the idea the work of the shot is in the execution, because the, the fun part really is, hey, this was really cool, let's think of this really great shot, and it does this and this and this, and then all of a sudden it's, oh, oh, the work of it is now, how do we make that work? And then the critical part of it is, as in any creative process, is how do I criticize this to be somewhat reflective of the thing that we thought of six weeks ago or six minutes ago? You know, and is that satis is that working? And that's the work of the, of the of the process. And it's the same thing, I think. You know, with anything, like in, in a creative way. Yeah, it's, it, it's exactly that. You you must <laughs> you you must you you know you must consider that uh, things are never completed, completely achieved. There's always a way to make it better. It's, it, it's staying critical is the most important thing. And understanding as an operator, now that I'm, like I said, I've been a DP for 20 years, that you are the final arbitrator of that. It's what Philippe first started saying, is that the operator says, well, I, I nicked the light. And you go, well, yes, but that's not going to be ever in. You know, so that's the, the other side of that critical part. Um, and I have to tell you, like, I operated an uh, interview with a vampire for Philippe, uh, with Philippe, and uh, we went to see the first screening premiere in New York City uh, with um, everybody's there, the studio's there. We're at Warner Brothers in, in Manhattan, and there's a big party afterwards, and sitting with all the mukti mukti people and the movie stars and the Tom Cruises and whatnot. And I am mortified because I, I have to find him because I, when I watch the film, there was one of his Chinese lanterns was in the shot. And I went to Neil, and I was like so upset. I went to Philippe, and I was like, no, it's not. And I go, yes, it is. And I called up, uh, who was our editor? Um, Mick also. Yeah, yeah, Mick also was the editor, and I called him up. And I said, go to this thing, go to there, take a look at this on the, on the flatbed. And he goes, oh, yeah, it's in there. But, you know, it's staying, so get over it. <laughs> <laughs> That is to say, I was still in that critical mode, you know. There you go. Uh, yeah, I think we get uh, just, towards the end. Okay, with the one last just one. Just a final, yeah, just a final thing. Uh, this is for Philippe. I think uh, here we, we love talking about gear and technical things and all those things, even talking about Steadicam a lot, apparently. But um, what I just wanted to say is just thank you for being a wonderful human being. I think we're all thinking about this in the back of our minds right now. It's just like, this has been like, seriously, like, wonderful. Honestly, like, 
the, the best event of the, of the whole festival so far, I think like we're all thinking about this. And Anastas, you're cool too, man, but you know? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. It's always a pleasure to exchange words, ideas, and, and things like that. And um, I'm going to make a little bit of publicity. I'm doing another of this uh, circus act on my, on my own, and that's very scary, on Friday at 1 o'clock, I think. 1.30. 1 1.30, yes, thank you. And uh, it's, I just want to have a conversation about nights. Is anyone as interested? You're it's very gonna, welcome. It's, it's going to be amazing because, you know. No, it will. It really will. Yeah. And I get 10%. Emocjonujących wrażeń życzy Energa z Grupy Orle. Sponsor strategiczny festiwalu Energa Camera Image. Electronic medical services available to the residents of the Kujawsko Pomorskie Wojewodeship. Results from ultrasound and X ray machines are immediately transferred onto the doctor's computer and are available online. What does it mean for you? Faster diagnostics, no waiting in queues, easy communication with doctors from different units, and access to test results at any time. We provide electronic medical documentation for you. Toruń znajduje się na liście Światowego Dziedzictwa Kulturowego UNESCO. To też miejsce, które kocha film z wzajemnością, stając się planem zdjęciowym dla wielu produkcji. Ciekawe plenery pomoże Ci szybko znaleźć kujawsko-pomorski geoportal. Największa przestrzenna baza wiedzy o regionie. To publiczny, darmowy, dostępny dla każdego zbiór map. Prezentuje m.in. ponad miliony działek, budynków, drogi, placówki oświatowe, zabytki i obszary chronione. Wejdź na geoportal Mój Region Info i kręć w Kujawsko-Pomorskiem.
odpręż się i daj się porwać emocjom. Prawdziwe przeżycie. Coś dla każdego. Spędź jesień z kanałami Filmbox. Poruszające biografie. Uciekam przed nienawiścią. Historyczne zwycięstwa. Filmy pełne wzruszeń i emocji. Raz się żyje. W listopadzie w Kino Polska. Włącz RMF Classic i zmień swój świat. RMF Classic. Najpiękniejsza muzyka filmowa. Fakty RMF. Najbardziej wiarygodne źródło informacji. RMF FM. Radio numer jeden w Polsce. Szybka, intuicyjna, przejrzysta, nowa RPPL. Polecam redaktor naczelny Cezary Szymanek. Nadszedł czas, by usiąść w kinowym hotelu. Poczuć dreszcz filmowych emocji. Otoczyć się ekranami Screen X. Poczuć każdy ruch i zakręt z Hordy X. I powtórzyć to kolejny raz i kolejny. Ile tylko chcesz. Najwyższy czas. Poczuć magię kina. W najlepszym wydaniu. Przeżywaj więcej. Cinema City. Partnerem motoryzacyjnym festiwalu Kamer Image jest Autofrelik. Autoryzowany dealer Mercedes-Benz. Chcesz być z nami? Zaszczep się.